Hi, welcome to Nursing School Explain. In this video on coronary angiogram that is sometimes also referred to as PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention. And if you think about it, percutaneous means through the skin. So we access the skin or through the skin to, um, to get access to the coronary arteries. And this is the first line treatment when the patient has a STEMI or an ST elevation MI. Please watch my other video where I go about the detail into STEMI, non-STEMI and myocardial infarction. The goal of this procedure is to open up an occluded coronary artery or multiple arteries and maybe place a stent to keep it open permanently. Now, typically when the patient is suffering from a STEMI, an acute myocardial infarction, the, we want to get the patient to this procedure within 90 minutes of the patient entering the hospital. It's called door to balloon time. When this is a treatment also for unstable angina or non-STEMI, which basically means that this is nothing as acute right now, but we still have to evaluate the patient's coronary arteries, then typically we have about 12 to 24 hours to get this done. So it's not quite as emergent. As for the procedure, it's usually performed by the cardiologist or an electrophysiologist if they have been trained to do so. And they access either the femoral or radial artery depending on the patient's anatomy and the physician's preference. And so a catheter is inserted in one of those arteries and then with a camera is threaded all the way down to the heart. And it allows the physician or the provider to look at the coronary arteries from the inside and determine the percentage or the degree of the occlusion if it's partially or completely occluded. And they use contrast media to do that. And so by injecting contrast media, there's also a separate monitor where they can, um, on a big monitor, see what is happening on these coronary arteries because of that camera that's been inserted. Um, they can determine the degree of the blockage and then the presence of any collateral circulation. And I'll have a separate video on what collateral circulation is. And then a stent can be inserted as needed if there is a certain percentage of blockage. The stent is a device that can be inserted that kind of helps to open up and keep that coronary artery open and restore the blood flow distally from that occlusion. Now, as you can imagine, we are inserting something, a foreign object, into the patient's heart, into the arteries that supply the patient's heart. So there are certainly complications involved. And they involve injuries to the coronary artery when that inner lining of the coronary artery may be a little bit nicked. It can lead to a dissection, which then means that inner layer of that coronary artery is bulging out and eventually it can rupture. It can lead to an acute MI if we're just doing this for um, unstable angina or non-stemming if the patient is not quite having that acute MI yet. It can lead to, lead to a stent embolus every time we mess with really for lack of better terms or we manipulate a clot it can burst off so it can cause an embolus that then gets into the bloodstream which then can dislodge and get settled in the brain and cause a stroke. It can also lead to coronary artery spasm where that artery just gets irritated and then the patient might experience symptoms during the procedure. If this is a significant MI and STEMI and the patient may have hypoperfusion with a low blood pressure because of a low cardiac output because the pumping ability of the heart is impaired, it might also lead to acute kidney injury from pre-renal um, causes and that is hypovolemia in this case. And I have a separate video that talks about acute kidney injury if you're interested. Certainly there can be bleeding either from the coronary arteries themselves or from the insertion site, whether it's the radial or the femoral artery. Anytime we cut the patient's skin open, there's a risk for infection. We talked about stroke. There might be a need for a cabbage, which is a coronary artery bypass graft. And that many times is indicated if there are more than three arteries that are pretty blocked or pretty much occluded. 
um, or if the location of the blockage is in such a spot that a stent would be difficult or impossible to be inserted. And certainly whenever we manipulate the patient's heart physically or, or, or manually with that stent and the camera, it can lead to dysrhythmias because that heart muscle can be irritated during the procedure. Now for our nursing considerations, I've divided them into pre and post procedure. So before we have the procedure, we have to check the patient for allergies and that is mostly because they are going to be getting this contrast media. So we need to assess them for contrast dye allergies as well as any other allergies they might have. We need to make sure that they are in PO. Of course, it's of an if it's an emergency, that's always um, an exception. We need to check their EKG that they've uh, most likely done um, or hopefully done in this patient. Check the consent. Of course, we're just the witnesses to signing that consent. And certainly we want to have the emergency equipment ready. If we are going to manipulate the patient's heart in any way, all kinds of things can happen that we just discussed in the complications here. So we want to have the crash cart and defibrillator ready to go and also have intubation equipment ready in case this is needed. We want to manage their medications and I have a whole separate video that explains the different medications that are needed for treatment of MI. And then we want to talk to our patients and explain to them the access site, what does it involve, um, what is it going to feel like, the contrast media side effects, and this is a typical contrast media as if you were given the patient contrast for let's say a, a CAT scan. So the patient might feel flushed, they might feel like they're going to urinate on themselves, but these are just side effects from the contrast. They might experience palpitations and it's good to tell them about this ahead of time, otherwise it might contribute, contribute to the anxiety they might already experience because of the procedure itself. And then the need for the continuous monitor and also we might want to hook them up to the cardiac monitor and the defibrillator to have it ready and so that we have the equipment ready to go in case we need to use it. And certainly we'll need to explain that to the patient before we head into the procedure. Now after the procedure, the most important part is to check the distal five P's, the distal circulation, um, whether that is the radial artery, so we'll assess the hand, or if it's been the femoral artery, then it would be the foot that we assess because whenever we manipulate an artery here, it can lead to neurovascular compl complications. And so we need to be able to assess for those. And then the insertion side, as you can imagine, the access goes through an artery. So there's a high risk for bleeding. And if the bleeding is not stopped right away, it can lead to a hematoma that can get fairly big. And if there's continuous oozing or bleeding, there might be significant blood loss involved. So we want to keep an eye on that site. And I wrote here ABCs because this comes up on exams all the time too. And if you think about bleeding, it has to do with circulation. So that would be a C problem. So that is a high priority list on your option choices when it comes to exams. We want to monitor the patient's vital signs frequently and that's per protocol as with any post-op patient more frequently right after the procedure and if things are normal then we can space out the time frame that we check those vital signs. Certainly we want to do repeat EKGs and keep the patient on the cardiac monitor. Assess the cardiovascular and respiratory systems frequently because things might happen and they might change after this procedure because we've just manipulated their blood supply to, to their heart. We want to keep the patient flat or on bed rest. That is mostly the case if it's been the femoral artery because we don't want the patient to bend their leg and kind of put pressure on this insertion site. Radial artery sites are a little bit easier to manage, although we want to immobilize them and teach the patient on what to watch out for. Um, the, plate, the patient will need to be on antiplatelets for at least 12 months if a stent has been inserted. And the reason is that a stent is a foreign body and our body wants to get rid of or kind of encapsulate anything that's not normal. And platelets kind of help us with that function. 
So we want to inhibit these platelets from aggregating at the stent sites because if they just keep clumping and clumping and clumping together, eventually that stent will be occluded. So antiplatelets help here and most cardiologists like to keep the patients on for 12 months and then reevaluate to see how the patient is doing and reevaluate the need for the antiplatelets. And then certainly also after the procedure, we want to check the patient's urine output and renal function because we know in case they've gone hypovolemic or the contrast media has a bad effect on the patient, it can lead to acute kidney injury and the best indicator of that is urinary output. And then we also want to check the patient's neurostatus for any changes because we know that um, complications also include a stroke. So if we don't check the patient's neurostatus, we're not going to be able to assess them for signs and symptoms of a stroke. Now, the other procedure that I talked briefly about over here is cabbage, so it's the bypass graft. I'll talk about this in a separate video because it's a completely different surgery that's much more invasive and um, has a potential for more complications and, of course, is much more involved in terms of nursing care. So watch out for that video. Thanks for watching. Please give me a thumbs, thumbs up if you've enjoyed this video and I'll see you soon right here on Nursing School Explained. Thanks for watching.